Good evening and welcome once again to the shop. Thank you for stopping by and hanging out a little in the shop tonight. This is a very unusual evening as for the first time in Shop Night Live history, we have a full live, they're fairly alive, studio audience. So let me welcome you once again to this, this is Shop Night Live. Very good. I had to point, there was a little delay. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> but we'll see how that works out. All right. So tonight, I've got a little different thing for you. We, I've shown this Lombardi trophy a number of times in the past, but never really talked deeply about how it was made. And so many people pick it up and say, wow, how in the world did you make that? And I'm, you know, First, I think, why in the world did I make this? I'm not real sure, but um, I, I just had a compulsion to make this thing, and I went through a number of processes to figure out how best to go at it. And actually, there's a lot of good woodworking principles that are entailed in making this piece. I know everybody, after I'm done this, is gonna wanna run out and make a Lombardi trophy. <laughs> Right? <laughs> no, I don't know if anyone will ever make one of these, but um, after this, I think you might want to try. But it's more the principles and the, and the little, little things that I had to figure out as I went along and made it that I wanted to share with you. So it, it really is two different projects. There's two different, uh, very different types of woodworking here. There's the ball and the base itself. Now before I could get started, I had to have a plan. And this is where it gets tricky because if you look online, you're gonna see all types of reproductions of this. A lot of silver ones and a lot of funny looking ones. Like immediately, if you've seen this trophy and really looked hard at it, you'll see what's wrong with them. Some of them are really overly fat, squatty. The ball's pitched at, a, at an odd angle. It's almost like laying at a 22 degree angle, whatever. And our things are just misshapen and out of proportion. But I was telling the group here earlier that around here, see, we're in New Hampshire, we're in New England. We've seen this a lot lately. And... <laughs> I'm sorry. Not much lately. <laughs> no. Well, six times in the last 20 years. And, it, and you get tired of it. You know, you get tired of it, like parading around and all that. And it's just boring. No. <laughs> I say that as a joke. And I know some people are really mad right now. But hey, I was a Patriots fan when they were going 2-14. and 14. No, it was Owen. <laughs> what was it? I don't I remember how many games. They played 14 games back then, right? So it was 0-14 or a ridiculous, sad, pitiful year. And nobody cared about them then, but here we are. All right, so I just want to show you, I went online to try to get the right proportions of this trophy, and there was a lot of, a lot of confusion of, of, I wanted to get this, these dimensions right, because a lot of the ones I saw, this, this shape was not accurate. So one of the best ways that I found was I went online and I looked at a how to, um, what's it called? How to make, making this, the Lombardi trophy. I don't know if they say the word Super Bowl, or whatever, because you're not supposed to say that, I guess. But I'm not like this highly funded pro program here, so <laughs> I'm not worried about it. But I, I looked online and I looked at a lot of variations and actually blew up photos, as many photos as I could see of it. You know, all those photos of like, Tom Brady holding it up like this. And, you know, you could get really good pictures. There were a number of angles from different years, and I got a lot of different <laughs> proportions of that trophy. All right, sorry, enough of that. Uh, but I did go once to, um, to I almost called it Foxborough Stadium. Uh, that's, that's old days, or Schaefer Stadium. Uh, <laughs> I went to Gillette Stadium. On a, we had this special little treat and got into the, the Hall of Fame in there. And check this out. Can you see this photo? 
We were going to project this on the screen, but whoops, sorry. Yeah, hold it. All right, so I'm in the dark kind of there, right? Not unusual, actually. But you can see those trophies behind. So I got to actually up close to the real ones, and I could see that I was on the right track with this. And then later on, I should show you this one. Me and the uh, camera lady got <laughs> photobombed by Pat the Patriot. <laughs> and every time I look at this picture, I'm a little creeped out by that look in Pat's eye. He's taunting me. He's got his arm around the camera lady. It's not looking good. All right, so anyway, I'm getting a little off track here tonight. <laughs> but I, I wanted to show you uh, actually this photograph that I blew up from the background of the video that I was just talking about of making the Super Bowl trophy. There's actually this, this uh, video that you can go, we'll put a link to it later. But um, look at the detail on this when you blow it up. I discovered that this was actually one of numerous pages that they made to to uh, get the drawing here. And this one's actually for the function, the way the ball attaches to the base. See that? It's all about the threading of a rod down. And then at the bottom, it even talks about the, the nut and, uh, and the weight in the bottom of the trophy. There's a little weight down there. It shows the exact dimension of where the uh, shield is from the bottom. How far is that? Can you zoom in on it? Anyway, it's about five, whatever it is, I, oh, I can do it. What am I doing? It's five and five sixteenths or something like that, right to the bottom point. And so then this is one of the key elements that helped me really get the right shape. Look at this. This is the, the uh, base of it. So they were showing this and on all the plans, you can assume it's the same. And it said right there in tiny little numbers, six and 13 sixteenths point to point. I knew I had it then. <laughs> and so I just uh, scaled the whole thing. I knew it was exactly 22 inches tall. And then I just needed the dimension of the neck of it right under the ball. Because it looks so different. It looks wide face on. Like if you look at the ball face on and then as you turn it to the side, it gets much narrower looking. So to get that right dimension was a little tricky. But also just a, t t a touch of history. What's cool about this is when you zoom in on it, you realize that these were like the original drawings because this plan was, the plan for this trophy, it didn't even exist. There was no Super Bowl name then. It was just some, the championship. And in 1967, um, what's his name? Pete Rosell, it was one of those gathering at a, over, at a uh, for a meal over a napkin and sketching the new trophy. And he met with the, the, the head designer at Tiffany's in New York and they sketched it out. And basically the concept was let's make an elongated kicking tee and set the ball on the tee. And, but what, what they ended up with was this iconic um, design, which when you think of all the major league sports, is there a better trophy than this one as far as just just for the visual design of it i mean you got you got the stanley cup that thing it's great but it's almost made a joke of and people carry it all around they got to put all those names on it it's it's kind of funny and then you got well the nba is not bad you got the the basket with the basketball but but baseball i mean they got like all these flags sticking up around that. I mean, there's just no, there's nothing about that that's memorable and iconic. But this, this is the epitome. So anyway, P. Rosell and he got into that talk. And you can see the date on this. It actually says, um, the trademark, it says this was December of 1966. So they sketched this up early. And the emblem that they have on there if you look at the, all the numerous stars, that's how the early um, logo was. It had all those stars. They changed it around to the more contemporary version, which I don't know if you can see that on there. Yeah, there you go. Only four stars on each side of the ball in the middle. Much cleaner, much, uh, much more contemporary as far as a logo goes. So anyway, 
I had fun like figuring that out and I did get finally I scaled enough photos online to find out this was a little over three inches here so once I had that dimension I knew the height to the this point I was able to start drawing it out so let me show you what I came up with this is my drawing for this trophy so this is the actual drawing and it's not it's somewhat like the Tiffany's model in a way, but I just had the overall, I knew it was 22. The ball is actual size. An actual size NFL football is 11 inches long and six and a half inches in diameter. So that was the actual size. That was easy, right? Once you had that, and I figured out it was pitched at a 45 degree angle, and then I could draw the base so I've got the base drawn down here showing it's kind of tricky because you're looking at from three dimensions and this is kind of the side view right here so I'm showing a center line that's what's confusing about this this line is a center line so that's not one of the edges of the trophy but that's the center of this kind of three-sided shape here so this radius I was able to figure out eventually but anyway that got me going and I was able to uh, decide that how high I had to make the various pattern pieces so and then this this is that key element I found that it was three and a quarter at that height and this is just the front view showing again the six and thirteen sixteenths right off the original drawing all right so let's take this baby apart I'm going to show you a couple different ways. Now, this, a, a number of people ask me on, I think it's on YouTube, like, hey, how much for that right now? I'll buy that right now. Because I have a video up there of making this. And uh, I always write back, I said, it's actually priceless. It's like, <laughs> it took me so long to make. No, it's, I said, look, to buy this right now, I would have to get $5,000. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I mean, the amount of time you get in it right and everything. But I'm not going to, I really don't want to sell it, especially after I dropped it. I dropped it, and it hit on the corner, and I got a little tiny dent in the ball. I mean, I can repair it, but I actually, this is kind of the prototype, so I didn't want to sell it. But notice what I just did. I took that bottom nut off, and this is, this is from pretty much that drawing that was on that, the official drawing. So here's the rod threaded in. I, I just embedded a grommet at a 45 degree angle right into one of the seams. And that allowed me to fit it right on. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But once you take this out, you basically have the two components that make up this trophy. Now, this base is constructed very differently from this ball. This is a laminated process where we're laminating uh, Italian bending plywood over a form and then cutting it to the correct shape and joining it together and then assembling so it can fit the rod. This is just a big hunk of solid wood. But check it out, I used my own little football as a template to create this football and um, some of the methods that they used on the draw on the video I incorporated in woodworking so they built their they built the original out of sterling silver so working metal is a different process altogether where these sides where these sides were uh, laminated for me they were just rolled on a machine they rolled a flat plate of sterling silver and you can go to that video it's pretty cool to watch how they work um, metal like that and then they I guess they braze or I, do you call it welding does anyone in this room know does anyone there know do you call it welding or brazing when you when you weld the corners nobody in here is saying anything so I, <laughs> I'm kind of stuck I'm counting on you <laughs> that's usually the way it is all right so anyway um, these 
this is a different process. Now, I thought about, when I was going to build it, making this out of solid. Silver soldering. Silver soldering. Thank you. Lee says. Who said? Lee. Who? Lee. Lee. I thought you said Glee. I was and like, Michael says type on three. Type on. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Does he work for, for silver so solder? Thank you, Daniel. What is it? What'd you say? Two people said silver solder. Silver soldering. Okay. I can okay, kind of imagine stress. what that's like. All right. So anyway, I thought about making this out of solid wood, but you can think, think about the problems inherent in that method. If this were a solid piece, you know, you could figure out a way maybe to sh set up a router jig, which I have done in weird shapes like that where you get in coves, and you could set it to do a three-sided tapering kind of router until you got it just right. But you would have these really fragile corners that would want to break pretty easily. And you'd have to drill through that whole mass as well and get it pretty straight. But it would be a faster way if you could execute it than a lamination. But it's not as strong and reliable as this. I mean, this is so, once you get set up for this, it's, it's really a reliable way of creating a solid, strong base. So I decided to go with the lamination. That's a very different process from this hunk of solid wood. So what I'm going to do right now is start, I just want to talk through some of the aspects of the base and then we'll get to the ball a little bit. I'm just going to hit some of the highlights and the tricky uh, bridges I had to cross to make this. But while I'm doing that, I'm going to hand off this football to this group and they're going to pass it around and there'll be no fumbling. If there's a fumble, you will have to run a lap around the shop. <laughs> All right. So anyway, uh, it's not that it hasn't been dropped before, so don't, don't worry. But you can get a close look at it. We'll all know if it drops. <laughs> that ball has actually no never been held by, that's the first time it's held by someone else than me, except for on this. <laughs> so there you go. It's a football shape, exactly. All right, so, so how do we do that base? Well, it all goes back to the drawing and this arc. So once I, I knew this arc and the depth of it, I had to calculate what the sweep or radius of that arc was because I wanted to begin to build a form for it. And I found my old pattern. I didn't find my initial template, but let's see. I've got it actually. Oh, I got it right on the drawing here. Sorry. We'll have to go back to the drawing. Okay, yeah. sure. Back to the drawing board. Can do. All right, so here we've got the radius. And I've got a little axis up here showing the center. is It's a 10 and 7 eighths inch radius. Okay? So if anybody wants to steal this, be my guest. <laughs> it's a 10 and 7 eighths radius. And then so to build the form, I actually build the form a little smaller in diameter. So depending on the thickness of layers I'm going to use on top of my form ribs. So here the the top of the form is it's about close to three eighths of an inch. So I think I went like ten and a half to the radius of the form pieces which I formed using this little template jig. So this is the the jig here in this group. We're going to talk a little bit more about form building on in a couple mornings but you're going to miss out on that. Sorry. We're going to do it. <laughs> no. I'm going to show you right now. I made a bunch of ribs like that. And then we, uh, I, ba I made a form. I'm not going to show you the whole process, but. Tom, I have a question. Okay. Lupe's curious how you calculated the radius number. Oh, good question. Good question, Lupe. What I did was I, I just, I knew I had that. Point, that my, that's my center point. So I struck a line first. And then I think I just uh, set up a sweeping arm with a pin. And I just kept moving the pin until the radius followed that arc perfectly. So I just, it's kind of like a trial and error, just moving the pin. You'll get close to it pretty rapidly. And before I knew it, um, 
it came out right to that seven eighths, 10 and seven eighths to give me that even of a sweep. So it's nothing more than that. It wasn't like a mathematical thing. It's kind of a feel the way, feel it out to get it. So once I had all these arcs here, I had my rib pieces. I could have made a short little form like this. And you can see some ribs in there. This has that same arc there. But you would have had to do three separate glue ups. So of course, I thought, hey, rather than just one short little form, I can do all of these glue ups in one and just cut the pieces to length. I can get all three out of one. So I made a form that was long enough to get all three sides out of it at once. So you need about a rough 15 inches to, because I think they come down to a little over 14 or so, 14 and a half or something like that. So that's how I do it. I just take a long, my long form here, and it goes into the vacuum bag, the vacuum press, but I make it up out of five layers of eighth inch Italian bending ply. So it's bending, it bends very easily in this direction. And it's got a really nice texture and consistency. It's, it's pretty smooth and reliably flat. And then just glue up between all those layers. It goes on the form. I actually tack it to the center. You can see all this being done kind of high speed in the video. And then it goes into the vacuum bag and is pressed to conform to this form. And when it comes out, it looks something like this guy. Okay, so this is exactly, this is five layers of Italian bending ply. And it's, what's great about it is it's super stable and very rigid. We have a question. What did you use for glue for the, for the Oh. The question is what did he use for glue for the Italian bending ply? That was Craig. Good question, Craig. <laughs> He's right here. Um, actually, are you talking about the form, like putting the, on the form itself or the layers here? The layers. Oh, good question. Like, I, I have gone back and forth. Initially, um, with the glue on something like this, I used to think the only glue to use was a glue that dried very hard and brittle and didn't move at all like dried almost like glass. Uh, there's another term for that and I'm forgetting what it is. Somebody tell me what it is. But anyway, um, so I would use this urea formaldehyde type glue that you would mix up, you know, Unibond um, 300? No, what is it? Eight, 800. 800. And then there's a Unibond 100, which isn't technically that, but it's sort of like a, a regular glue, like an alphatic resin glue with that something added. Anyway, I decided to do an experiment sometime later and try some regular adhesives like Type On 3, which is a very high quality adhesive, super strong, it's considered the strongest in that, that Type Bond range. But it does have a little flex to it, but I have seen no flex back on these. Because if you think about it, you've got five layers all glued up. So every single layer would have to fail to some degree or slip to some degree for that to change. And there's no real stress to it. It's bending ply, so it bends easily. It's very reliable. And it's not as messy and as hassle as the urea formaldehyde, which takes a long time to dry. And it's heat, it needs to be high enough temperature and all that wear. So this is just a good old Type Bond 3 for this one. How's that, Craig? Tom, while you're um, at this point, I have another question. Maven says um, the arc was already on the plan you copied, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, I am. Uh, I got it from the plan. I mean, I, I had to measure to get the arc. I couldn't, they didn't say the actual sweep of the arc. So I, I measured it across the points and scaled it to come up with what I have. And I mean, if you look at that, doesn't that look just like it? <laughs> it's, I don't know, it might be a slight micro off, I don't know. But anyway, that's the whole thing. So um, I just made this one up and you know, I didn't want to break out my motorized vacuum bag because that's the only bag 
I have to fit this. I can't use the manual bag. I don't have one of those long enough. And, but I wanted to make a sample. I didn't have one of these around. So just for kicks, this is another way you can do it without even a vacuum press. I just took a piece of eighth inch uh, Italian bending ply and I ripped a piece, let's see, when I fold it around the form like this, see how that f that's like kind of flat and parallel to the bottom of my form? So I wanted to, I just glued those on as glue rails and I was able to stack, laminate all of these I put them on, I put my center lines on, and then I just threw clamps on both sides of this. And this stretched across and acted like a vacuum bag almost, you know. It wasn't quite the same, but it, it came out essentially identical. You can't really tell. So that's a way you can get by in certain cases without a vacuum press if you want to just use pressure. Just, you just want to get that angle. I just calculated what that was with a bevel gauge and ripped it on the table saw glued it on there. It took, didn't take time at all. All right. So once I have this, now I'm not going to go into all this. This is kind of nerdy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. From your perspective. Maybe. But we love that. <laughs> it's all nerdy though, right? Isn't that what you really think? All right. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. I think only good things. <laughs> all right. So here it is. Now I've got to shape it into one of the three sides for my base. So what I did was I made a um, frame here. Let's see, where is it? Oh, here it is. I made a template. So here I've got half the width right here and then of the base from that, let me show you this side, from that center line. So that's the center line going right up. And then this is half of the three and a quarter. Remember that? So that would be an inch and five eighths for those following along at home. And then what I did was I drilled a little a hole here, an eighth inch right dead on the center line. And that way I could use my form and drilling a second hole on this, on the, on this, back of this form, see those two holes? Those actually were, were cut so that this template could go right on there and those become indexing pins. We haven't talked a lot about indexing pins in, on courses we've done, but as you get into curved work or complex work that or you want to be sure that everything's lined up, they're great help. So I put the pins in there and I was able to route the side of that template. And then just flipping my pattern, I index pinned again, same exact, and then I routed the other side of my template, right on the center line. So then I knew I had this perfect arced shape, this is the same as the bending form, with the perfect taper for my sides of each leg. So then I was able to put this on, I lined up my center lines, make a pencil mark on both sides and bandsaw that rough to the line. Then I come back and I actually tack it to the base and route using a router bit. Where is it? Like this, like a, get that router bit. Let's just swing it over here. So the bearing's riding on my template and it's cutting a perfect smooth edge all the way up. So you end up with a perfectly identical shape of this. Of course, the curve is reverse. It's a concave cur curve, but it's, so this little template was made just to make that cut. But what it did was it gave me three identical, perfectly tapered and centered and balanced pieces like that. So once I had that, now was one of the head scratching portions of it because now that you have your three pieces, how are you going to join the corners? So you have to cut this very kind of steep miter joint along the whole length so that the, the corners will blow up. And you can watch that cut in the video. I actually set it up on my little uh, tenoning jig and adjust the blade over. Um, it's about 30 degrees, right? Yeah, it would have to be. Because <laughs> um, if you think about it, 
I was thinking about it, but I got some help with them. Matt, Matt was nodding, so I think I was right. Uh, <laughs> but if you think that the three coordinates have to add up to 180, these these three here, then you've got each one 60, 30. Right. Perfect. Okay. So uh, that's how I did it, and I had to mess around with it. And once that was done, then I clamped all the corners. I had some little call blocks. That went on. Now, before I did that, I I laminated a piece of overly thick cherry. So this is a 16th inch thick cherry veneer. Now you can get this type of veneer. It's called special thickness veneer from different veneer deal dealers. Like uh, right now, certainly wood is probably my favorite place. Uh, you can go on their websites and see what they have in special thickness veneers. They have a variety, not just a sixteenth, you know, they'll have a tenth, um, thick, thicker, unusually thicker veneer, which comes in really handy if you're going to laminate something. Um, and here, I wanted thicker than normal veneer because I wanted to get out to the edge here, be able to sand it, and have it reliably thick enough that I wasn't going to break through and give it a nice soft edge, just like the Tiffany's model that I could see. You know, and it feels good in your hand. So when you hold it up at the end. It feels good. It's not cutting into your hand at all. All right. So anyway, that's what we did. I, I laminated that on there as a secondary step um, before I glued. I cut the the parallel, the taper, and that angle. And one little fun part that we did was I used a CNC for the first time, a CNC machine for the very first time, and um, I had to find out what the font was that is on the trophy. Can anyone guess what that font is? Lombardi. <laughs> it's Lombardi font. Yeah. Helvetica. I think it was I think it was what's that one New New Times? It's a, Yeah, I think no, no, but it doesn't have any of those little things. You know what? I, I this is this I'm an embarrassing moment here cuz I asked you and I it's been so long I totally forgot the answer. <laughs> So, I forget. I'll have to find out. I'm sorry. I should have brought that up. <laughs> All right. But anyway, whatever it was, we it was a perfect it. match. <laughs> so, okay. And then I got it scaled just right because it had to fit identically at the right height and the right dimension off the sides of the original. So, it worked out beautifully to use a friend of mine's uh, CNC just calculating the vectors and all that and it was especially useful in doing the shield because let me show you something here back on the pictures because in this video you're going to see that this was constructed very much like the original because the shield is a separate piece of silver and it's actually uh, cut out this is a later one can you can see the more the video was done more recently, so they've got the modern logo. And um, it's, it would be soldered, right? Sterling. It would be silver soldered, I guess, onto the right location. And so I just had it in the 16th inch material and had it, it used to be right there. It went through the CNC machine and I had to do some cleanup and actually carve those little lines in the football those little lines those were actually hand carved the rest of it was all cut on the cnc and you got to chop the tabs off and clean it up but then that went on the form again and this time i just clamped it and got it nicely centered so that was added on and it sits proud just like the original does so there you go that was the detail involved there let me see if i can Okay. All right, so once that was done, uh, this it got a little tricky in terms of uh, cutting the shape for the ball. I wanted to pre-rough it out because this ball has to nest right on this, you know, three-dimensional curve in an angle and a football shape, you know? So how do you get that curve? Well, from the drawing, I was able to make some calculations and got close. And I actually made these little templates just to saw out the, the top before I glued it up. So this was my guess to the curve. 
and then you can see that line is the good line. It's a little lower than that where it ended up being. I ended up tracing it on the ball, on the frame, once it was done. The side I missed more. I really missed. I, I cut it too flat. But that was okay. I could always take it away. But it took a, a bit of work to trial and error to fit that ball down onto that curve. So next time I'm going to, I'll cut this template out to that good line because that was done by holding it right up to what works. See that? So this will, is my new template for just cutting those shapes. And, and they pre-cut those and then it gets glued up. And then I had to glue in those little triangular blocks with a hole drilled in the middle so that it would mount, give a good anchor for the rod. And that was just tracing and cutting and fitting pieces in there. All right, so that was in a nutshell the base of this trophy. And it took no time at all, hardly. Right? All right. So we'll, uh, where'd the ball go? Football. <laughs> Throw me a pass, clunk. <laughs> All right, well, I have to, due to technical difficulties, I'll pass this around while I'm working on the ball. It's, all right. So here, once we had the base done, then it was time to actually make the top part. And this was just copying a real football. So it's almost like, you know, one of those, uh, like making a cake, right? You know how they always make cakes and make them look to like real things? I can imagine a cake being made like just like a football. But with wood, I don't know, it might take a little longer than a cake, right? But maybe not. I don't know how long cakes take. Does any, has anyone done that? I'm not a cake maker, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have a friend who probably could do it, right? <laughs> All right, so once you get the Hey, Tom, I got a question here. Yeah, sure. Um, Will says, you mentioned the bevel cuts on the base were 30 degrees each to total 180. Would they not be 60 to total, th total 360 in total? Not on a triangle. A triangle ends up is the total of the triangle angles is always 180. Oh. This is very confusing. Okay, Nathan's asking, does the base lean to offset the weight of the ball? No, actually, it does not because the ball, oops, the ball is centered on the center axis. It really is centered on there. So it's pivoting perfectly. See that center point on the ball? That, I was intentionally setting this, so that's the center point of my drawn ball there. That's the center line of the base comes right up through that middle point. So this is the top view of the base. So it comes right up. It actually sits with the weight dead centered over that column. So it's not, you don't have to move it one way or the other. It is top heavy though. You know, that it's because this is a solid ball and this is not as heavy a base, it's top heavy. I think that's why they put the weight on the bottom of the Tiffany's model because that they must have experienced the same thing. I know with the Tiffany's model, they actually fill the ball with some type of uh, dense foam or something in order to keep it less likely to get dented unless you throw a baseball at it, <laughs> right? But it's less likely to get dented, um, but also um, to counterbalance and make it way more at the base. Mine is not so good like that. It's kind of heavy at the top and I didn't add any weight to the base because when I weighed it overall, it weighed almost, it weighed exactly, this original is seven pounds and this was just an ounce under seven pounds, my, my trophy. So I didn't want to change it. I thought, hey, it's the right size and weight. Is that the weight of just the ball, Tom, or the whole trophy? The whole trophy. What is yeah. the weight of the ball, do you know? I don't know, but it's most of that, <laughs> right? Wouldn't you guys say? It's probably five pounds, right? It's probably five pounds. So it would be hard to throw this any great distance. <laughs> and even harder to catch it. <laughs> All right, so. Tim, Tim Coleman is on here, and he says a soccer ball would have been easier. Yeah, that's true, Tim. <laughs> hey, Tim. 
Hey, we're looking forward to seeing you. Tomorrow, well, Saturday. No, not tomorrow. Yeah, Saturday. You started to sweat for a second there, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. But anyway, um, to make the solid ball, we're going to glue up solid materials. And rather than try to find one big chunk of wood, it's to your advantage to glue up smaller materials. And I'll show you why in a second. First of all, it's really hard to find dry material this large. You know, you could cut a tree, but you're going to probably have the center of the tree somewhere and crack. Um, but it would take, take a long time to dry a piece. It would be worth it, would be worth it though, right? <laughs> it's, it's a worthwhile project, of course. But actually, I found it's, it's easier and better to cut it out of kiln-dried material into, in four quadrants to glue it up in four quadrants. So the thing about this is a little tricky because an actual ball, as I mentioned earlier, is six and a half inches in diameter. Your typical kiln-dried material goes from roughly three inches square or thick to four inches. So you kind of got to lose a lot. If you're going to go with the, you got to buy 16 quarter material and cut all but a quarter off. To, I mean, all but a quarter off over three to get your four quadrants. It's kind of a little, feels a little wasteful. But um, so this is, a big ball. You, you need like 16 quarter material if you're going to make the actual size ball, usually, unless you have your own. I have had some inquiries, though, from fantasy football leagues that said, hey, that would be an awesome trophy to have in our leagues. And I agree. I think it would be an awesome trophy. And actually, I want to, now, I, now I get it in my head that I want to remake this at a two thirds scale. So, by, because it's kind of big, right? I mean, the original, it doesn't need to be that big for a fantasy football league. I mean, it's fantasy. <laughs> it's, it, it doesn't matter, right? It's not real. <laughs> None of it's real. So it could be two-thirds. It could be a fraction. No one would know. But I feel like two-thirds, what's nice about two-thirds is that if you take two-thirds of six and a quarter, it's roughly four touch over four. So then your, your quadrants only need to be two inches square to get that ball. So it's going to be quite a bit smaller, but if everything's done in proportion, it'll look really cool and it would be an awesome trophy. Did anyway. You, Tom, uh, Michael's curious if you have considered making it hollow. <coughs> the ball? No. <laughs> that would be hard. I haven't figured out how to make it hollow. If anybody has any idea, I guess you could Oh, I know what you could do. Yeah, you could. No, you couldn't. No, you could. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could uh, get your four quadrants all squared up. Let me just go to that now. That's a good question. Now you got me thinking. So I got these, these pieces of cherry, which I, wanted, I put uh, arrows on them so I could reassemble. So this is how it was actually in the plank. Now there was some more here. These I cut a little bit out of the middle because I was trying to get similar curvature of the grain at each end. So there was kind of a flat area in the middle there. And so in order to get balanced curve on all my four quadrants, I cut it to one side or the other. And now I have these four quadrants that come together just like that. So now I have to figure out, okay, how do I want to orient this grain? If you look at it, it's circular this way. So if I came and I just flipped, or let's say I just wanted to turn it down like this. Now the end grain is all kind of circling in. Now that would, might look decent, but it would be very kind of plain sawn out here because this arc is following the, almost the curvature of the grain. So you have this real flat, unexciting figure out here. So I don't really, I'm not crazy about that one, but if I take it this way, like let's say I have it like this, and let's say we just flip it. Now we could have, no, we got the same thing. I meant to go like this. Let's flip it like this. Yeah, that's how I meant to do it. 
So now you see how the different it is. Now I've got all this linear grain coming to the outside. So when the ball is turned, most of the surface will be more linear and you'll have a nice kind of linear grain around. Now you, so you can play around with that. Do you prefer the linear or the flat sawn? It doesn't really matter. But I think I would glue this one up this way. And the nice thing is you can get rid of some defects. I got these chunks for the this knot. But this is going to be turned down to a point. So all that's gone. But I was just thinking about that question again. Once you've established your quadrants and you know roughly the size of the ball, I suppose you could bandsaw on an angle out like a little curvature here. On, you'd have to do some calculations, right, on all the inside corners. And then when you glued it up, you would have, back to, that's not where it was. Then when you glue it back up, you'd have that hollow kind of, almost like the interior of a coconut, right? Good illustration. <laughs> Everyone knows a good coconut. It's kind of thick, right? So you don't want to risk going through. But it would lighten up the ball. So I, would th I think I'd go about it that way. The only issue you would have is that when you're turning, if you didn't saw that perfectly, you might have an imbalance. So even if you've turned the ball circular, you might be feeling a vibration where you wouldn't likely get that when you're turning in solid. All right. So what I did, what, what I would do is... I'm not going to do this. They suggest turning in two halves and then glue the halves together. Make it in halves, Claude says as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea too. You could, you could make it like that and have paper. Is that what you're saying, Lupe, Claude? Yeah, you could do it with paper and then take it apart and scoop it out and then glue it back. They don't mention the paper. Yeah. Cut it down the middle. I, a lot of times we would use like, if you want to split a turning or whatever, you can use like heavy, like grocery bag paper and glue it up like that. And once you're turned, you can split it and all those fibers would split. Then you could hollow it out as best you can. She says make two bowls and then glue them together. Anyway. I don't know. You could possibly, you know what? That's actually a potentially a good point because if you watch the video on the <laughs> sterling silver uh, football, that's made in two ends. Believe it or not, the Super Bowl trophy has a seam right across the middle and you will never see it on the polished ball example. It's, it's made of two basic cones like that. And then they solder it together and polish it so beautifully that it looks imperceivable that way. But I don't know how you have a joint like that. How do you do two bowls? I don't, I don't get it. How to get that shape. Unless, it's, unless you're having your seam in the middle. You'd have to have two bowls come together like that. And now you're going to make... So you want that unbroken seam there. But anyway, once, once I've got... I would put some glue and glue up each half here and always using like a heavy kind of grade clamp. So you'll use a heavy grade clamp there and there, making sure I've got a really tight joint. And then you could always re-skim that. And then when you glue it up this way, you make sure that your points are exactly hitting on both ends, exactly. So that's your axis for turning on the lathe. So I've got another ball over here. And I've got this axis right on the center of the cuts. Let me, let me plug this in real quick here. All right, so I won't get into that much more. Basically, it's a, as a turning project, it's just, you just turn the football and be done with it, right? You're going to turn it as close as you can to the actual shape of a ball and then uh, before it's taken off the axis if you have a locking a locking kind of axis on your your lathe you can hold it and do a lot of the work then so here's here's where it gets fun you've got to make some faux laces and these laces that I made are just like 
the ones, the way they do it in metal. So this is, this is actually where it gets the same as metal. So you can see, see this person is actually putting the laces on the Super Bowl trophy. And each one is just brave. So by seeing this, I thought, oh, okay. I just have to make like a dent on each side so it looks like the, the hole for the leather and then put a lace that dies right at the top of it and we'll have it. And then the wider laces down the middle. So by looking at a real ball, you've got eight holes on each side and your laces and you just have to bend the wood to do that. Just have to do that. No <laughs> but that's where it got a little tricky. I want to show you one of the techniques that I learned in this process that may be applicable. So here's what I just figured out. Like the width of the laces, the holes, point, center to center is one inch. Okay, so I made this template a bending form for the laces. So I, I discovered the radius of 3 16 was perfect to get that curvature there. So I just ran this as a template form and then I could put it in the vise. And I thought, okay, a quick way of bending wood is to wet it. So I got a piece of standard cherry veneer. I thought, okay, this might work. It wasn't quite thick enough though, you know? So I tried some thicker veneer, but it wouldn't work. And then I tried this and I thought, okay, maybe I can bend it. But you gotta bend it this way around that pretty severe corner. So I could let it sit for a while in water. You know, you could actually put this in a double boiler and do a steaming. It wouldn't take long to steam a piece of wood like that, right? It would be fully saturated and very pliable. You could do it that way. And then I just bring over my iron, Hamilton Beach, right? And, and then you would very slowly bend it over the curve. But whenever I did this, it was almost too much. And you can see how it's fracturing. It started to fracture on the corner. It was too much, too fast, didn't really work, and I didn't steam it or anything like that. So I decided I would soak it in some veneer softener, which I did these pieces. And I already spritzed these with some veneer softener, but I'll hit them with a little water, because that'll help for the bend. And then with the iron nice and hot, I'm gonna hold this centered. I just hold it on there, let it get nice and hot. And then just, again, this time it's been a little more prepared for this treatment. We bend it right around the corner. And it's gonna be more agreeable and pliable to make that bend. So I have no, no issues that time with it at all. And then I would do it the other side. I don't move that slowly usually. I'm gonna move a little faster. I got a little bit of a burn. And then once I get it to the other side, I could put tape on it, or I could just bring one of these little guys. While it's still hot and Oops. Very smoothly, you put the clamp on <laughs> just like that. Like you do it all the time. Yeah. I gotta adjust this clamp. Okay, so then you get it centered and you can kind of let it pull down. And there, you're just gonna let it cool and dry to that shape. Now, I discovered that one layer wasn't tough enough, it wasn't strong enough. So I actually bent two like this, and then once I had those cooled off and dry, I'd have two just like this. Okay, they're nice and formed, no cracks. I'm able to put now a little glue in there. So we're gonna laminate our, la our laces to make a nice, strong, thin piece of wood. Get a mosquito. I don't know when you'd ever use this technique. <laughs> you ever used a heat gun, Tom, to bend them? 
a heat gun. I have not used hot air, but actually what I prefer, and I broke it, was this little, uh, it was like a mini iron, and there were no holes in it. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? It was like a miniature iron and had a handle on it. It was specifically made to give you nice even heat. And I, I was using the handle as a pressure bar so much, I finally broke it. Uh, kind of sad. In the video of mine, you see me, I'm using that. Now I got this. Could you have made it out of so a solid, Claude is asking? A solid and cut a curve? You could, but I like, I just like the way this actually bends. I don't know if they could make it solid. It'd be, it'd be tricky because it would want to, it'd be very short grain on the bend. It wouldn't, it would be very fragile. As you bend, you'd be going into end grain. So you have to really do it like this. So once I get the, all that glue, I can kind of push this down and let it pull nicely. And now I've got that in the form, two layers glued up. So when those come out, I have a pretty strong material like this. It's very strong. It's got the correct angle. Now I just need to cut them to length. So let me get this out of the way. And now I'm thinking, okay, I got to make these slices. And they're roughly 530 seconds. Roughly. Roughly. Yeah. I decided that they're, they're almost... 3 sixteenths, but they're more than three eighths, more than an eighth. So you've got to cut these around. So how are you going to do that? Well, one of the best ways Glad you caught that. is a, just a marking gauge. You sharpen your marking gauge knife. That's going to hold the fence the exact angle. Now I'm going to step in front of you. Oh, actually, let me do it this way. I'll do it like that up in the air this way. I haven't done this for a long time, so I should have practiced. So anyway, I'm going to square this end up first. So I put it on here, and now I've got my marking gauge set. I'm just going to cut around. Just make a nice cut here. Don't move. And pay no attention to the light in your face. This is what I'm talking about. You guys never see this one. It's when it clunks into my head that I really like it. <laughs> it's like, whoops, the Whoa. bicycle on the Sorry. top of the car. <laughs> you didn't mean to do that. All right, so there, I've, I've squared it up nicely and I could sand it a little on the end. I can always do that after. But once I've got that clean, now I can just Bring the end flush to the end here. Okay, and this is how I went about the process. I got it flush. You can use the face like that. Now I've got my marking gauge set the perfect 530 seconds. I can just cut right around. Man, I hope this works. I gotta get my finger right out of the way. But that's a nice sharp beveled edge knife in there. That feels about right. I'm, I'm in an awkward position here. I'm going to get down a little. Okay, I think that should come off. Okay, there we have a lace. So then we just sand the edge. And I would sand it a little more, but there now I have a nice sturdy lace like that, double thick. And all I need to do, I'm just going to approximate this one, is take a chisel. And I want to leave about an eighth of an inch around the bend. I'm just going to eyeball this. And then the other side. I had to figure this out, so... I wouldn't ruin too many laces, but. So that's what you end up having, a nice little arc. And that goes over the center laces, which are just straight. And these are glued on. Let's take our practice ball. This was my ball that I practiced on a lot of these things. So I practiced making those dimples, like different methods. I won't get into that right now, but then 
once these are glued on then these laces just like the Tiffany's are set in place in the hole and they appear to stitch right into that little dimple right there and that's how you fool the eye and those get glued on top in the middle what's the matter people saying things Lupe says this is so Lupe says this is so geeky <laughs> and yet we're watching. I'm sorry. I like it. Yeah, it is geeky. I, like it. I mean, when you stop and think about what you're doing, it's like, did you wait consider, a minute. Um, How did I get here? <laughs> Michael's curious if you considered making the laces out of white leather, just like the ball, and gluing it on. Uh, that would not be wood. Michael? <laughs> no, actually, that's a good question. But I didn't want to mix mediums. I didn't want to try to make it look like a ball. I wanted the wood to look like laces. So it's a, it's a different preference. You know, you could do laces on there, and that would be a totally, that would be a cool look, too, because you'd expect to feel a ball, a soft ball, and you go, wow, that thing's wood. Yeah, so you could do that as well. But this process forced me to think of some pretty geeky techniques <laughs> for laminating little bends of wood like that. Um, Thanks for taking care of it for us, Tom. The very last thing I want to show you with the ball, and the people always comment on this, are how realistic the seams look, and even down to the stitching in the seams. And uh, if you watch the original Tiffany's video, I never would have noticed that, but they're actually... In one of the videos, there's a woman, she has a small punch, and she's just tapping, boom, 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 every sixteenth of an inch or so with the punch right down the middle of the seams to appear like the genuine stitching. Because the ball is actually sewn inside out, and then it's pulled inside out of itself with the, through this opening, and you're seeing the stitches from underneath stretching across where it's stitched around the other side. So anyway, um, the way I do that is, I'll show you on this little ball here. Let's take this side here. Is I just take a... Just like a melon. The advantage of gluing up the four quadrants I meant to say was that the seams show you exactly where you want to carve the seams of the ball, okay? Because you have four equal quadrants in this actual stitched up ball. And here we've got those as well. So I'm gonna go with the uh, knife. I'm gonna use my, my old timer. Pug gave me this knife, so this has a real sentimental value. Like, this is 30 years old. I don't use it that much. Well, that's but a knife. That's a knife. I <laughs> that's not a knife. All right, so this is a knife. <laughs> he used to like rough out balling claws, I'm not kidding you, with a knife. I've seen him do it. He could do it with other chisels as well. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to show you right on the seam. I like using this knife because I can see, and I'm just going to initially get a nice cut right down the seam, just to set, set the game here so I can track my carving chisel a little more easily. I'm just gonna take a V-groove type chisel. For those curious, it's a Swiss made 12-6. And I'm gonna set it right in there where I feel a little cut. And I'm just gonna let this kind of like V or veining chisel start the, the cut right down. And you wanna go in this direction because you're going to with the grain as you go all the way down I could keep going right to the end of the ball then you're going to do it again go a little progressively deeper it's just it's fun nice little carving technique you're trying to keep even pressure as you go over now this is giving you kind of a V groove so it's not perfect actually and you know you're looking at the real ball to see, all right, how deep do I want to go with this? Because you're trying to imitate reality in wood. And then once I get that far, now I've got this little card scraper-like thing made out of a, 
it looks like an old shopsmith blade or something, but it's a heavy blade. And um, a friend of mine cut this out. And this is really great on, on truing up reeds on bedposts and things. I've used it a lot for that. But I've actually pushed a burr over on that. So it's your homemade uh, scraper. And that curve is perfect for sitting right in the bead. And then, I can't really see, but I'll just do it by faith. I'm going to go forward. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm softening that edge. See what's happening? I'll do it again. It's like just card scraping. But see, this edge is sharp over here. Now it's starting to feel more realistic like a ball. I'll go down the other side. Just lightly scraping here. The nerding out gets, <laughs> gets deeper and deeper with this project. I can't stop thinking about that now. I'm, uh, <laughs> it's like, what am I doing with my life? All right, here I go. <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to take the uh, 150 and just sand it so it really looks like the rollover of an actual fabric. That's pretty good. Okay. Then lastly, I hope I have that thing accessible. Oh, you know what? I'll have to make another one really quick. All you need is a nail, and I'm just going to use this nail. Excuse me. I'm going to go behind you here for a second. We're going to use this for a second. Over here. Over here. Sorry. I thought you were coming back to... I'm going to just... I'm going to just make a flat on this nail. Okay, so there, we have a homemade punch, a little nail, I made a little flat, can you see it there? I'll turn it to the side. So it's just got a nice little flat. That's great camera work. Oh, let me put it in front of my shirt. There you go. Now, I've got it all set. What? <laughs> I'm gonna get my, my mallet. And I'm just going to set it in there. If it was a little wide, I would make it. But I'm going to angle my stitches slightly because that's how they really are. you got to really look at everything. I'm just going to lightly tap and skip about every sixteenth of an inch. You know, I heard, I read a lot about this trophy just to increase the weirdness of it all. And uh, discovered that I got some discrepancies in value, but I think the original Super Bowl trophy is said to be worth $50,000 in sterling silver. So if you wanted to buy one, so why should this be worth much less? All right, so anyway, <laughs> I got a little carried away my spacing there, but um, this is, pretty much how it was made. I don't, I went a little too far apart, but you can see the comparison. This ball is a little tighter. You see him? And my, my test is probably better down here. But that's essentially how you create the appearance of a stitched ball. Just a simple little punch like that. So by looking at the original, just figure it out like that. And then Lastly, I had to drill that center hole. I had to set up a little jig. So this would go in right at 45 degrees, pivoting right on the center. So I had to have everything so it was in the center axis. And then, where's our pedestal? Oh, where's it? Oh, there it is, yeah, okay. Thank you. I don't know if I can... Now that I remember this, I think it was a little tricky to get it to come out that hole. Tom, have there been any copyright, copyright issues on building this? Copyright? No. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, no one's come after me.
for making this one, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I think anybody could do this. It's not actually a dead on copy because they did it from pictures online. Yeah, out of wood. So <laughs> I suppose if I made it in sterling silver, if I they might were have an issue. They probably wouldn't have put up the plans all over the place. Well, they're kind of in the background. That was a little stealth <laughs> to get those. All right, so there was a lot of fitting for that ball, but in the end, was it worth it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to have this forever on my shelf. And uh, I'll have the sign of my fumbling and dropping it as Does well. Does it have an air valve? Bill Johnson is a, a Bill What? Johnson. Does it have an air valve? Air valve, yeah. Yeah, you got to pump it out every so often. And um, Tom, were uh, the, the markings, the stitches, were they flat or horizontal? Excuse me, flat horizontal or flat vertical? Flat when you're making it, you're flat. I was angling them a little. You know what? I have to, I'd have to look. This is not the most perfect ball those look pretty this, this is not a great ball I just looked at the way they were on the trophy itself the actual Lombardi trophy and I'm not sure what that question is how did you finish them I went straight across on these I don't know why I was angling there I think I well it's pretty close a little angle how did I finish I used um, water locks of course I used uh, original water locks and then I finished with a satin water locks. Now I had a little issue because the ball was significantly darker and redder than the base. So this, this coloring on this piece is actually me experimenting with different reds and different dyes and powders like pigments to get the base into the red tones here because it really was quite different. So you can see and then, but it came in really nicely. I got it nice and colored. Of course, it was, I was doing this as they were apart, so it wasn't a problem getting it there. And uh, got the right color tone. Because here you're end grain, so it's going to read darker. And then as you get around, I was really trying to match the color tones on the side, on the flat grain, as I'm in here. Flat grain, flat grain. So you can really see the color tones are most closely approximated here and here. All right. We, Any other we questions? Need some Lombardi music right here. Dun, 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 dun. Oh yeah, we need the the music. Dun, 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 dun. What's that? Uh, well, anyway. Clearly, we're, we're when they not. raise the banner, they always play this music at Gillette. I've gotten to know it really well. It's like a, it's a it's a cool anthem. Enough, enough. <laughs> uh, I know it's awful. Did you? Is it uh, the ball made made out of cherry? Did you say that? Yes, the ball is cherry and the base is cherry. This is 16th inch thick cherry on the three surfaces with a solid yeah. ball in veneer. Norman's saying perfect time to use orange peel effect on the finish, maybe? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you use like an orange peel effect, you would get maybe something like a cowhide graining, but uh, no. You just used somebody, a uh, friend CNC, right? You didn't? Yeah. It'd be nice to have one if anyone who wants to like have me try one out. Just a small model would be fine. I don't need a big put to get my Vince Lombardi logo. There's but there's a lot of fun with this, like carving the end so that it looked like it, it wrapped in. That's kind of tricky because if you look at the real ball, to make it look like it's pulling in, that's like a little added bonus fun to it. If there are no other questions, are there none? <laughs> Getting a lot of comments about Deflate Gate. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they didn't win any after that. <laughs> anyway. Sorry, I, this is getting it's ugly. It's just fun. It's all I fun. I know, it's all fun. It is all fun. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us and being a part of another episode of Shop Night Live. Remember, if you like this content, you enjoy it, please consider subscribing and sharing it with your friends and comment as you wish.
no mean comments, all right? I was only kidding. Don't take it so seriously. It's, it's, <laughs> it's sports. It's just a joke, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, again, just welcome to our Epic Weekend people that are here with us. So fun. Yes, I once again, I'm so grateful to have done this one in front of a live studio audience. <laughs> Woo! Very good. We do have a few openings in the September one. If anybody's interested, go to our website. Uh, we'd love to have you come. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time, right back here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Huh? Oh, yeah. Hey.